Welcome everybody, good morning, and uh, welcome to the second day of uh, CPM. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next uh, invited speaker, Carl uh, Brigman, who is a professor at Saarland University and also affiliated uh, with uh, Max Planck Institute of uh, Informatics. Um, yeah, Carl already in his uh, young short career won a lot of uh, awards. I'm going to mention two of them, the EATCS Distinguished Dissertation Award in 2015, and uh, quite recently the EATCS uh, Pressburger Award for, awarded for a uh, distinguished young scientist in 2019, uh, which I read uh, was about his work in fine-grained complexity, and uh, which relates to the current talk. So, uh, Carl will tell us now a little bit about fine-grained complexity in relation to string form. Please. Right. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. I uh, will be talking about fine-grained complexity on strings. So fine-grained complexity is a relatively new term for something that has been done for a long time, namely to prove conditional lower bounds based on assumptions on threesum, on matrix multiplication, and recently, based on the strong exponential time hypothesis. matrix multiplication, and recently, based on the strong exponential time hypothesis. I am having a heavy feedback here. I am having a heavy feedback. Maybe, okay, thanks. Um, right, so, um, but let me start more generally by, uh, uh, right, by giving an introduction to um to to fine grained complexity or to conditional lower bounds and uh, let me take take you back five years uh, and how we taught dynamic programming back then and still teach dynamic programming so one of the typical example problems that we use to teach dynamic programming is longest common subsequence don't need to define the problem uh, in this uh, for this audience right so if you have the strings difficulty and industry if you're looking for the longest common subsequence, then this uh, turns out to be duty. Um, and it's uh, used all over the place for differential file comparisons. And this here is uh, a comparison of two different versions of a Wikipedia file. And the algorithm that we teach uh, to undergraduate students how to solve, how to compute the longest common subsequence is this uh, dynamic programming algorithm that runs in n squared time. Right, which builds this huge table, n by n table, and the entry at position i comma j stores the length of the LCS of the first i symbols in x and the first j symbols in y. And then there's this very short piece of code that fills out one table entry. Um, it fills out one table entry in constant time. Uh, and there's a slight improvement by this uh, by some log factors. Uh, but that's uh, basically the, the best known running time that we have, at least if you only look at the input size n. Now we use this uh, as an algorithm that we tell our students when we teach them dynamic programming. But uh, do we actually know whether this is optimal? And at least five years ago, we didn't know anything. Um, I mean, we don't know a faster algorithm. We also don't, didn't know any reason why it should be optimal or why there shouldn't be a faster algorithm. Okay, let me talk about the second problem. Um, that's basically the only non-string problem I will be talking about, but, um, but I'm sure you all know it. Subset sum problem, where we're given a set X of N positive integers and a target T, and we want to know whether some subset of X sums to T. So for example, if those are our input numbers here and our target is 42, then, oh, come on, why doesn't, So our input numbers, then yes, there is a subset that sums to the target, namely if you select 5, 7, and 30, then you sum to the target. Uh, it's one of the original NP-complete problems. It draws much of its importance from being a special case of many other problems, like knapsack problem, integer programming, lots of other problems are generalizations of subset sum. And uh, it also, it's a, uh, 
uh, important for modern crypto because um, like, uh, one branch of lattice based crypto uh, essentially deals with uh, a variant of subset sum called the short integer solution problem. So it's an important problem. Um, and the, like one of the two algorithms that uh, our students see in their undergraduate courses is this uh, pseudo polynomial time dynamic programming algorithm, right? Where again, you build this huge table. Now the table encodes whether among the first i items you can sum to a number s. And then if you fill out this whole table where each entry can be filled in constant time, then you solve the problem and the running time is order n times t. And again, uh, that's used uh, to teach dynamic programming to undergrad students. Uh, but but we know whether there is a fast algorithm. And uh, well, at least five years ago, we didn't know this. So um, whether longest common subsequence is in time into the 1.99 or subset sum is in say time into the 0.99 times t. Um, that was pretty much open. Uh, and we didn't even have like an explanation of why we cannot find a fast algorithm. Um, one issue is of course that the standard tools for lower bounds that they, they are not really applicable. So if you I mean, if you prove NP hardness, then it's I mean it's certainly useful to know about subset sum, but it's too coarse to distinguish time n versus n squared or time t versus n times t. And uh, we can also not hope for any unconditional lower bounds because basically we only know how to prove n log n lower bounds, um, except for like some very highly specialized problems. Okay, so everything, anything that we can hope for are conditional lower bounds. Uh, so what I mean by this, so you pick some classic fundamental well-studied problem A, this has some best known running time t of n. And then because this is so long studied, it makes sense to conjecture that it doesn't have a fast algorithm. So let's pose the hypothesis that this problem A does not have a t of n to the one minus epsilon time algorithm. And now uh, once we have this kind of hypothesis, we can relate the problem to other problems. So if we have a re uh, reduction from problem A to some other problem B, then this hypothesis gives us a conditional lower bound for B. This is the kind of conditional lower bounds that I'm shooting for here. Now, uh, what are the problems? Um, uh, the, the, the classic problems that, uh, that people st are starting from here. So uh, in the polynomial time regime, one of the first that has been used here is the three sum problem, right? This uh, old paper by Guy and Tan and Overmars, where they introduced the conjecture that well, if you want to test whether among n given numbers any three sum to zero, then you cannot do this in subquadratic time. Another classically used hypothesis is for matrix multiplication or Boolean matrix multiplication. Um, so our, our failure to, to solve matrix multiplication in quadratic time, you can pose as a hypothesis that it shouldn't be possible to, to multiply matrices in quadratic time or even in something close to quadratic time. Um, and here, um, I, I don't really know what is the first paper that did this. Certainly in 2002, Lee did this. Uh, I'm sure that there are also older papers, but I'm not sure what's the right citation here. Um, what I will be focused on in this talk is the strong exponential time hypothesis. Oh, come on, what is happening here? Um, Namely, uh, the hypothesis that satisfiability is not in sub-exponential time, or more precisely, not in time two to the one minus epsilon n. Um, right, and this came up. Uh, I mean, it was posed in two thousand one. It was not un basically not until two thousand thirteen that you had uh, lower bounds for polynomial time problems based on the strong exponential time hypothesis. So, at least inside P, this is a very recent hypothesis. And this is what I will be talking about today. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the low bounds based on three sum and best multiplication. We'll focus here on this strong exponential time hypothesis, which is much more recent. Okay, so let's go back to these two problems that we have. Um, 
uh, let me remind you that, I mean, we teach this in integrated courses, right? So literally every year, thousands of students see these algorithms here and uh, lots of um, um, uh, other people that organize these courses, they also see these algorithms and think about them again. So should they all have overlooked a faster algorithm? That, that sounds unreasonable, right? And indeed, like for the longest common subsequence problem, uh, you can prove that um, if you get a strongly subcritic algorithm, so running time n to the two minus epsilon for longest common subsequence, then the strong exponential time hypothesis fails. Meaning that, um, well, such a, such a breakthrough for LCS would not be just a single breakthrough, it would also be a breakthrough for a satisfiability problem. So it would have further consequences beyond just solving the single problem. Now, so pri uh, uh, this, was, um, yeah, this was independently proven by two uh, groups of researchers, so me and Marvin Kuhnemann and uh, Abut Buckers and Basileska Williams, both published at the same conference. Okay, so surprisingly, uh, for subset sum, actually people came up with fast algorithm. First, Kiliaris and Xu uh, brought it down to time roughly root n times t, and, uh, and then I improved it to randomized time linear n plus t. Um, right, so uh, surprisingly, there is a fast algorithm. And then uh, a short time ago, we, we came up with a matching lower bound for this improved algorithm. So the lower bound is t to the one minus epsilon times two to the little of n. Or in other words, if you want to get a sublinear dependence on the target t, then you have to pay an exponential factor in n. Okay, so um, now after these results, um, we have a satisfying picture in some sense. Um, we have matching upper and lower bounds for both of these problems. Um, Right. Uh, these lower bounds also show that there is a, like a, a really a difference between LCS and subset sum, right? Or that it, that it makes sense that we now have a conditional lower bound for long scan subsequence. Because for subset sum, we didn't have a lower bound. We came up with a fast algorithm and it, uh, it didn't have any immediate further consequences. I mean, there now is a fast algorithm for subset sum, but um, I mean, didn't have any immediate further consequences. For long scan subsequence, on the other hand, if you would get a faster algorithm, then it would have immediate further consequences, namely a breakthrough for the satisfiability problem. So th there is a big difference in having a problem with a conditional lower bound and improving the running time, and the problem without a conditional lower bound and improving the running time. So there is a lot of motivation to study and prove these conditional lower bounds. Here are some more. So obviously, I mean, we want to kind of finish problems in the sense that you determine the optimal running time, let's say up to lower order factors, and of course, up to some unproven hypothesis. Um, but this, this is also necessary. Um, um, the, whole, the whole area is also, also identifying central problems like this three sum matrix multiplication and satisfiability that I talked about. Um, obviously, you can start proving conditional lower bounds from any hypothesis that you want. Um, but then it's, I mean, it's much more believable if lots of people worked on it, if lots of people have proven the lower bound based on the same hypothesis. So in some sense, the area is identifying what are the central problems. Now, more importantly to the, the end users, uh, is that uh, these kind of lower bounds, they identify which problems you should work on and which problems you should not work on. So for example, you should definitely not work on improving the running time of longest common subsequence from quadratic to strongly subquadratic, right? I mean, you can still work on LCS, obviously, you can try to improve log factors, for example, or you can try to work on other parameters or variants of the problem or whatever, other settings. But if you, even if you believe that longest common subsequence has a strongly subcritic algorithm, it, it's not advised to directly work on LCS, right? Uh, because if you would get such an algorithm, you would also get the breakthrough sat for satisfiability. So you should first work on the satisfiability problem and get the breakthrough there, and then maybe later you can generalize it to LCS. So you should not work on this problem. 
On the other hand, there are some problems where, I mean, for subset sum, for example, I, I first studied the problem in trying to prove a conditional lower bound, and I failed to prove a conditional lower bound, and that's what led me to study algorithms uh, for this problem. Um, um, so, so in a sense, the so the failure to to prove a lower bound uh, tells you that it could make sense to to try to yeah, design new algorithms, and uh, and it sometimes even gives you hints on how these what these algorithms should do uh, in order to like exploit why your approach for a lower bound failed, and and the other way. So that's one thing that I like about the area is that even if you fail to do one thing, then oftentimes you can use it to do the opposite. Okay, um, now all of this hinges on um, on these conditional lower bounds. So what happens if um, if this like if the strong exponential time hypothesis turns out to be wrong? Is is all my work doomed then? Well, um, no. So first of all, uh, it would be great to to falsify this hypothesis because it would be a huge algorithmic breakthrough for the satisfiability problem. I would love to see that, even if it. Um, Makes some of my work less less relevant. Um, second reason is that there are, uh, really is a hierarchy of different hypotheses. So even if you break the strong exponential time hypothesis, and above that there is still the orthogonal vectors hypothesis, and there are a couple of other hypotheses in between. So um, so most likely we would still have a reason why longest common subsequence is hard, even if we have a faster satisfiability. And more generally, so this area is about stuttering the implications of current barriers. So, so these hypotheses that are formulated about three sum and satisfiability and so on, they formulate what are central barriers that we don't know how to overcome. And at any point in time, we will have some central barriers that we don't know how to overcome. And these should be formalized and studied what are the applications of them. Uh, because uh, because it tells us like which which problems to work on and which problems not to work on. Um, all right. Okay. So after this introduction, um, um, let me let me uh, come to a bit more of a tutorial part of the uh, of this talk, where I show you a couple of exemplary reductions. Um, right. So, so the strong exponential time hypothesis is about the satisfiability problem, more precisely this, the k sub problem. So you're given a satisfiability formula, so a, a k CNF more precisely, um, on n variables, and you want to know whether it's satisfiable. And the hypothesis basically says that k sub is not in time two to the one minus epsilon n. Now you have to be careful with the quantifiers on k and epsilon here, because it's it's not true for all k and epsilon. Um, more precisely, the, the hypothesis is stating this here, that whatever epsilon you pick, there exists a sufficiently large k, such that k sub is not in time two to the one minus epsilon. This is the strong exponential time hypothesis, or short Seth, or SETH, uh, as formalized by Impagliazzo and Paturi in 2001. Now, um, let me also tell you about the orthogonal vectors problem, um, because this is the intermediate problem to show Seth-based lower bounds for basically all polynomial time problems. Now, in the orthogonal vectors problem, you are given two sets of Boolean vectors, so sets A and B, that consist of d-dimensional 0, 1 vectors, and both sets have size n. And what we want to know is whether there is a vector in A and a vector in B, such that they are orthogonal, so their inner product is 0. Or in other words, in, there is no dimension where they both have a 1. Okay, uh, so naively you can solve this problem in time n squared times d, right? You enumerate all pairs of vectors, so the n squared pairs of vectors, and you can check whether they're orthogonal in times d. So the naive running time is n squared times d. And what Williams showed in 2005 is that um, this quadratic dependence on n is actually necessary. 
So you cannot get time n to the two minus epsilon times any polynomial dependence on d unless uh, this strong exponential time hypothesis fits. Okay, and he showed this by uh, reduction from satisfiability to a thermal vectors. Now, um, okay, so in this reduction, uh, he, I mean, he's taking a KCNF CNF formula and reducing it uh, and uh, computing an equivalent OV instance, uh, such that the number of vectors that he creates is two to the n over two, two to the number of variables over two, and the number of dimensions that he creates is n to the k, where k is the, the, the k of k set. Um, okay, now I claim this is, this is everything that you have to do here, right? Um, if, if you get such a reduction, then you also get this kind of lower bound for orthogonal vectors, because uh, well, if, if you would get this kind of, I'm not sure what is happening today. It's not allowing me to draw. Uh, if you would get this kind of running time here and you plug in the, the, uh, the bounds that we have, two to the n over two to the two minus epsilon. Oh God, no, I should not write today. I'm not sure what's happening. Anyways, I should not write today. Um, good, so anyways, if you plug in the this number of vectors to, to the n over two, if you plug this into a running time n to the two minus epsilon, then you get something that runs in better than two to the n time. And this polynomial dependence on D becomes a polynomial dependence on big N, so it also doesn't hurt. So if you would get this uh, improved running time for orthogonal vectors, then you would also violate the strong exponential time hypothesis. Okay. Um, Good, uh, so, so how does this reduction work? Um, so first of all, you, you split your variables into two halves, x1 through xn over two, and the remaining xn over two plus one through xn. And then you enumerate all the assignments of every half. So for every assignment alpha of left half of the variables, you create a vector a of alpha, uh, which encodes uh, the, the clauses satisfied by this half assignment. Um, right. Can you still hear me? Um, for some reason, my slides are acting up. Yes, we can still hear you. Um, oh, God. I am not sure what is happening here. Okay, now you can see the slides again, hopefully. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, right, so you split the variables into two halves. For each half, you enumerate the assignments of this half, and you create a vector for that. The vector encodes which classes are satisfied, or more precisely, um, when, um, when this half assignment alpha causes the ith class to be satisfied, then I put a zero in the ith dimension of the vector, otherwise I put a one. Similarly, I create the same kind of vector for, for the second half of, um, of variables. I create the B vectors in the very same way. And then um, it turns out that these vectors are orthogonal if and only if these two half assignments together form a satisfying assignment, right? Because um, uh, what are we checking here? Uh, vector to be orthogonal means that there should be no dimension where they're both one, meaning there should be no dimension where both, where both half assignments are not 
Um, right. Um, so it, it might be a bit weird to see this for the first time because it's a reduction from an exponential time problem for a polynomial time problem, but uh, not much is going on. So in the end, it's a simple reduction. Um, but let me not focus on this um, on this fine grained complexity background here, but let me go to actually some string problems. Uh, let me show you a lower bound for regular expression pattern matching. So I'm sure you all know regular expressions. So you, this example here in the top right uh, matches all strings that have that start with some number of C's followed by either one B or some number of A's, positive number of A's. And in this in the pattern matching problem, you are given a regular expression R and a string S, and you want to know whether some substring of S matches R. Right, this is what we do if, uh, if in the bash we do uh, some regular expression matching. And it's known since the 60s that this can be solved in quadratic time, uh, uh, the string length times the uh, size of the regular expression, meaning the number of operations in the regular expression. And uh, there's, easy, there's an easy lower bound from the orthogonal vectors problem. So reduction from orthogonal vectors to regular expression matching, which um, starting from little n many vectors in dimension d, creates a regular expression and a string of size order n times d. Now claim that as soon as you have this reduction, then you also show that this running time here is optimal, right? Because if you would now get a faster algorithm, big N times big M to the one minus epsilon. Then if you plug in this bound order of little n times D, what you get is actually something subquadratic in little n and some polynomial dependence on D. So you would violate what we know about the orthogonal vectors problem. So you would violate the strong exponential time hypothesis. So this reduction is all we have to show to find a matching lower bound for regular expression pattern matching. And uh, the reduction is actually something um, su super simple. Um, so what do we do? For, for, for each of the vectors in A, we create a string, which just writes down all the coordinates of the vector. Just write down A1 through AD as D symbols uh, over alphabet zero one. And then for every vector in B, you create a regular expression. Now, what if, so if the coordinate in B is a one, then it then the corresponding coordinate in A should be a zero to not be orthogonal. If the coordinate in B is a zero, then the corresponding coordinate in A can be either a zero or a one to be not orthogonal. So you just express this as an as a uh, regular expression, right? Zero or one as a regular expression, and to concatenate all these um, regular expressions for the for the uh, coordinates. You get one bigger regular expression that encodes all the vectors that are orthogonal to B. And then if you look at it, this the, the string SA that we created matches the regular expression RB if and only if A and B are orthogonal. Uh, okay, so this is what we do on a vector basis. And then uh, what do we do to choose one vector in A and choose one vector in B? Well, that's easily encodable for the pattern matching problem. In the string, we anyways choose a substring. So what we do is we uh, just concatenate all the vector gadget strings that we created, we concatenate them and pad with some delimiter symbol that I call hashtag here. Um, right? And then choosing a substring corresponds to choosing one of these vectors in A. And for the regular expression, we have the, the alternation, so this big OR. You put a big OR over all the regular expressions RB that we constructed for all the vectors in B. Um, and then matching this regular expression means that you have to choose one of these vectors in B. Okay, so now you can check that a substring of S matches R if and only if there is some vector in A and some vector in B such that they are a third. Good, uh, super simple reduction. Um, right, so um, this is, um, 
I know lots of people who actually teach this reduction uh, in aggregate courses now. I see Tori here, who, who I know has, has done this in the past. Um, uh, so it's it's really the simplest, the simplest example that I know of any set-based lower bound for a polynomial time problem, uh, apart from orthogonal vectors, which is mostly interesting as an intermediate problem. Um, this is the easiest application for some problem that people are actually interested in. Okay, um, so now we've seen a very simple example. So let's also see a more complicated example to show you that not all of these are lower bounds are trivial. Uh, and it will be the lower bound for longest common subsequence. So there we know that, uh, I mean, the problem can be solved in n square time on strings of length n. Now we want to see a, a reduction from orthogonal vectors to the longest common subsequence problem. And I claim that uh, given an instance of orthogonal vectors with little and many vectors and dimension d, I can create two strings of length order n d squared, such that if you compute if you compute their longest common subsequence length, um, then uh, then you solve the original orthogonal vectors instance. Right? If if I give you this kind of reduction, then again we get a matching quadratic lower bound, because if you would have n big n to the two minus epsilon algorithm for longest common subsequence. And then what you get is a subquadratic dependence on the number of factors times some polynomial dependence on D. So this would violate what we know about orthogonal vectors. Okay, so all we need to, all, all, I, all I want to convince you of now is that there is a reduction, takes an instance of orthogonal vectors, creates an equivalent instance of longest common subsequence of length order N D squared. Okay, how do you do that? So let's first simulate what um, what coordinates do. Uh, let me call this a coordinate gadget. Uh, my coordinate gadget consists of these four strings here. I have four strings of length three over alphabet zero one. Um, and I will so I will I will replace a zero in an a vector by the string zero zero one. I will replace a1 in an a vector by 1, 1, 1. And similarly, I will replace 0 and 1 for the b vectors by the strings in the bottom. Now, what, is the long, what are the longest common subsequence lengths of these strings? Well, you can check that almost all the pairs have longest common, have the longest common subsequence of length 2, except for 1, 1, 1 and 0, 0, 0, who have longest common subsequence of length 0. Okay, let's give it a check. Uh, and now what we will do is, well, uh, we take a vector in A and its ith coordinate and replace it by the corresponding string in the, in the top and take a vector in B and its ith coordinate and replace it by the corresponding string on the bottom. And I claim that their longest common subsequence, well, it's two if uh, at least one of them is zero and it's two minus two if they're both one. So the, the longest common subsequence length of these coordinate gadgets expresses the function two minus two ai times bi. And that's uh, already the first step to express the inner product of the vectors a and b, because now at least we have the product of two coordinates expressed as a longest common subsequence. Okay, now let me keep this in the top right. The next step is to actually get this to, to vectors. Uh, how the vector gadget uh, is supposed to encode the, the, the inner product of two vectors. Um, and here, so in the, in the picture, I have the dimensions just four. So what you just do is you, you uh, go over all the coordinates in your vector, you replace it by the corresponding coordinate gadget, and then in between you fill up with some new, some fresh symbol that I call two here. You just put sufficiently many twos in between. Sufficiently many, so two times d many twos is certainly sufficiently many. Um, just think of it as there's a large number of twos in between. Okay, now what I want to claim is that um, an optimal longest common subsequence of these two strings has to match all the twos 
and in between, in some locally optimal way, matches these coordinate gadgets. Right? Um, now, why is that? So, uh, so if you would uh, match in some underlined way, if you would match from AI to BI plus one or so, if you would match a symbol in A2 with a symbol in B3, then you certainly have to lose one of the two blocks. And this would be way too costly. Um, so along these lines, you can argue that, um, that uh, uh, you certainly only want to match uh, A2, symbols in A2 with symbols in B2. Uh, and so you want to have a, a, some kind of synchronous way of walking through these coordinate gadgets. So in between, you can certainly match all the twos. Okay, this was, was wake, not a, not a full proof here, but I, I hope you get the idea. Um, and once we establish this, then you can express the longest common subsequence length of these vector gadgets now as a function of the inner product. If you write this down, it's um, you match all the twos. This gives some number twos. And then you have for each uh, vector gadget, if it coordinate gadget, you get two minus two AI BI. So this is some constant minus twice the inner product of A and B. Okay, now we have uh, strings whose LCS express the inner product of two Boolean vectors. Um, there's actually one more step. Um, let me skip this here, but uh, there's one more step necessary to, to normalize this. Namely, it's not nice that the, the previous construction takes many different values because the inner product can be somewhere between zero and D. We will need in the end uh, some gadget that takes only two values. Uh, and you can do this in a simple way by padding with uh, fresh symbol three, once before and once after. And then you normalize this in a way that if the two vectors are orthogonal, you get a larger value, 2D squared in this case, some, some constant. If they are not orthogonal, you get some smaller constant, 2d squared minus 1. OK, um, it's, again, a simple construction um, similar to what we've seen before. So now we'll use this here that uh, we have these normalized vector gadgets. So if the vectors are orthogonal, you get c plus 1. If they're non orthogonal, you get c as LCS length. Now the, the really interesting part of the construction is how to, I mean, now we, we, we simulated orthogonality of two vectors. Um, and this was more or less straightforward, I mean, more or less. Um, we, had, we had a lot of freedom of choice there. Uh, the interesting part is this OR gadget here. So now we have to choose a vector in A and choose a vector in B and we want to choose them such that they are orthogonal. Um, and this uh, claim is done by this construction here. So again, we take a fresh symbol four with which we pad, and you uh, write down these vector gadgets for all the vectors in A. So first vector in A, second vector in A, third vector in A, and then you repeat them actually. So again, first vector in A, second vector in A, third vector in A, and so on. Um, so you write down all the vector gadgets twice and pad with the fresh symbol. And in the second string, you write down all the vector gadgets for the uh, vectors in B once. Uh, you pad with the same symbol. Uh, so this, this padding is some sufficiently large number of fours. And in uh, all these intermediate paddings have the same length. And then for the second string, you have a large number of fours in the beginning and a large number of fours in the end, more than the total number of fours in the first string. Okay, uh, I claim that this does the job. Um, and it, it actually has a relatively simple argument by why this works, why this expresses um, whether there exists an orthogonal vector. Um, so first of all, um, right, so, um, so uh, in one direction, we, we just, we have to construct a long common subsequence. And if there exists an orthogonal pair, we want to show that the longest common subsequence is long. Uh, so how do we construct a long common subsequence? 
Well, we, we pick an offset. So we align, the, we align B, vector B1 with some vector in A. So in the, in the picture, I chose to align B1 with A3. You can choose any of these offsets. Now, once you picked an offset, uh, you, you align all the, you, you go through this simultaneously. So you align B2 with A1, B3 with A2, and so on. Um, now, in between all these vector gadgets, we can match other fours. And then um, before the first matched vector gadget in A, we lose some vector gadgets, but at least we can match other fours because there are so many fours in the, in the beginning of the second string the bottom string. Um, and also in the end, uh, we lose some vector gadgets in the top string, but we can match, we can certainly match other fours in the top string. Okay. Um, what, what's the LCS that we get here? So first of all, note that we match all the fours in the top string. So let me write this number as this hashtag four, it's also just all the fours in the top string and we match all the fours in the top string. Um, and then we align N of these vector gadgets. For each one, we either get C or C plus one, right? So at least we get N times C from this. And if there is an orthogonal pair, then for some alignment, we align this orthogonal pair. So we get C plus one at one point. So certainly, if there is an orthogonal pair, we can choose this alignment to get an LCS of length. Well, you match all the fours, get n times c, and at least once you get a plus one. Okay, that's the, the positive case. Um, and then in the negative case, we want to show that if there is no orthogonal pair, you get something smaller. Um, okay, so. So th this here is the proof, one line proof. Um, so, all right, so let's assume that there is no orthogonal pair. Uh, what, is the, what is an upper bound on the length of the longest common subsequence of these two strings? So I split the alphabet. So uh, for, the, for the alphabet symbol four, I just count the number of occurrences in the top. Let's say we can, we can match all of those. And for the remaining alphabet symbols, I go over the vector gadgets in the bottom string. So let's sum up over all the J and look at the vector gadget of BJ. Now there are several cases what can happen here now. So for example, if no symbol in the vector gadget of BJ is matched, well then it doesn't contribute to the LCS, so we get a contribution of zero. If the vector gadget of BJ is matched to exactly one vector gadget in the top string, as in the left here, then we know what happens when the contribution is C, right? Because matching one vector gadget to one other vector gadget expresses orthogonality. And as we are in the case that there is no orthogonal pair, what we get is always C. And the remaining case is that symbols of this vector gadget bj are matched to different vector gadgets in the top string, like in the middle in the picture. Then we don't really know what happens to the vector gadget. Could be that all of the symbols in the vector gadget are matched. But what happens then is that this blocks one of the, one of the paddings of symbols, of symbols four in between. And if we block such a, uh, such a, such a block of fours, um, we cannot match it anymore, so we actually want to subtract it from our initial bound of we match all the fours. Um, so then the contribution, we can upper bound it by the length of the vector gadget of bj minus the length of one of these blocks of fours. And this is chosen in such a way that it's actually less than zero, meaning that in all of these cases, the contribution is at most c, meaning that at most we get total number of fours on the top string plus n times c. So, um, so we get these two cases. If, uh, yeah, so we showed this here. If there's no orthogonal pair, we get at most number of fours on the top string plus nt, n times c. If there is an orthogonal pair, we get at least one more. So if you can compute the longest common subsequence length of these two strings, then you're also solving uh, the orthogonal vectors problem. Okay, now uh, this uh, 
probably was too quick uh, to, to get all the, all the proof details, but uh, I mean, it, uh, in principle, this is, a, this is an, a, an easy, I mean, by now, I mean, it's, it's brought down to actually a, a very short argument uh, why this construction works. It was not easy to find this kind of OR gadget. The other gadgets are more straightforward. Um, if you're interested in more details here, I copy uh, lecture notes and slides into the chat. You can check out um, where, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I'm actually teaching uh, this kind of reduction. Um, all right, so check it out if you're interested. Um, and now we showed uh, this kind of flower bound here, right? That, um, I mean, we, we uh, I didn't argue, I mean, I didn't talk about the, the length of the strings that we construct here, but you can, you can check that um, all the vector gadgets actually have length order d squared, and we put order n of these vector gadgets next to each other, so the length is order n d squared. So we actually get um, construct an equivalent instance of longest common subsequence of sufficiently small length. So we get this quadratic lower bound based on the strong exponential time hypothesis. Good. Uh, so this was the technical or tutorial part of the of the talk. Now we'll um, come. Let me come to more of a discussion and let me uh, let me discuss some extensions of these results. Um, I talked about longest common subsequence. There are a couple of similar problems where a similar kind of proof works. Edit distance uh, is obviously very similar. There is the Frechet distance from computation geometry and then in time warping, which is another sequence similarity measure. And all of those have been shown hard around the same time, actually first Frechet distance, then edit distance, then longest common subsequence. Um, I showed you lower bounds from satisfiability. I can actually show that these problems are even harder in a sense. Uh, if you would get, say, subquadratic algorithm for LCS, then you would also show um, better than two to the n algorithms for not, not only for KSAT, but even for a stronger problem, uh, harder problem called formula set. So a formula doesn't have to be in conjunctive normal form, can be an arbitrary formula, similarly for branching programs. So actually these problems are even harder than just falsifying set. Um, now that we know that LCS is hard, um, actually some more hardness results follow by reducing LCS to other problems. You can show that some problems are LCS hard in a sense. Um, and those problems include longest palindromic subsequence and longest tandem subsequence. Uh, I showed you a reduction where the alphabet was, I guess, five. Uh, the same the same lower bound is actually known for binary alphabets, such as the symbol 0, 1. That's uh, significantly harder to prove. Uh, constructions get much more messy, but, but essentially it's the same idea that you want coordinate gadget, vector gadget, normalized vector gadget, or gadget, same kind of things. Um, but now, I mean, basically any two uh, symbols can interact, so it's harder to avoid um, uh, to avoid common subsequences that don't do what, what, what you want them to do. And there's also a generalization to k strings now. LCS of k strings actually takes time or omega n to the k minus epsilon. Um, and this is then not from the orthogonal vectors problem, but from a variant of it where you're given uh, k sets of vectors and you want to choose k vectors such that in, in no dimension, every vector has a one. So there are a couple of variants also of these hypotheses and intermediate problems. And um, based on the situation, it sometimes makes sense to choose one of these variants. Okay, I talked about the, the, main, um, the, the main parameter, the input size n. Actually, lots of other parameters have been studied for the LCS problem. So what people look at is the length of the longer string, let me call this little n, the length of the shorter string, let me call this a little m. Then the, the, the results, so the length of the LCS can also be a parameter 
if this is very short, then you can also more quickly solve the problem. Uh, and the alphabet size is an important parameter. Then you can look at the number of deletions that you need to go from X to the longest common subsequence. We call this big delta. Similarly, the number of deletions to go from Y to the longest common subsequence is little delta. Then there are a couple of more um, problem specific parameters. The number of matching pairs is uh, how many letters, how many pairs of a letter in X and a letter of Y are equal. The number of dominant pairs is um, uh, even more complicated to define, so let's not, let me not do this here. But uh, so what the, the string community came up with over the decades are uh, lots of, well, lots of algorithms uh, analyzed in these parameters. Uh, actually, the, the, the three fastest algorithms have this kind of running time here. So up to log factors, there's an algorithm by Apostolico running on time n plus d. There's an algorithm by Hirschberg running on time n plus little alpha times l. And an algorithm by Wu, Mamber, Myers, and Miller running in n plus little delta times big delta. And these three algorithms are incomparable. So for different strengths, for different settings of these parameters, different of these algorithms are, are better. Um, so you should always run all these three in parallel if you want the, the optimal synthetic running time. Um, and so what we did is to, to show that these three algorithms are actually optimal um, in the following sense. So if you fix this set of parameters, so you look at these eight parameters here, so the input size n plus these seven other parameters. And if you look at any slice of the problem now, what do I mean by a slice? So you pick, an, pick a constant alpha m, you pick an exponent for the parameter m, and you only look at those instances where the shorter string length is theta of n to the alpha m. And similarly, you pick an exponent of all the other parameters. This gives a slice of the problem. And what we did is to prove a conditional lower bound, as I showed you before, for each slice of the problem. Um, so for any parameter setting of the problem, we show that the running time that these three algorithms give you matches a, a conditional lower bound that we can prove. Um, right, so in terms of these eight parameters, optimal algorithms are known. Of course, what you could do is to add other parameters and, and in terms of other parameters, and we cannot say anything about this, um, but, but um, yeah, this is what it's not about parameterized LCS or multivariate LCS. Uh, let me skip the regular expressions to go to grammar compressed strings. Um, right. So if you, uh, what is it? What is this? Grammar compressed strings, I mean, you all will, will know much more about this than me. An example of this is in the top right. Um, so here you compress a string to, to a straight line program. Let's say we are given non-terminals S1 through Sn. And for each non-terminal, we have one of the rules, either the non-terminal maps to a terminal or alphabet symbol C, or the non-terminal maps to SL, SR, where L and R are smaller indices. Me, uh, and this means that uh, the text represented by SI is the text represented by SL, followed by the text represented by SR. And then the string that we actually want to represent is the string generated by the last long term. So here you see an example that generates the string 0101010101. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, now there, there are two important parameters here. So n, the number of non-terminals, this is the, what is called the compressed size. That's little n and big n, that's the length of the generated string. That's the, the uncompressed size. And in general, um, I mean, little n should be smaller than big n, otherwise it doesn't make, too, make sense to compress. Um, and, um, and in general, they, they can actually be up to uh, exponentially far from each other. So big n can be exponentially large in small n. Now, uh, this is 
this is a compression scheme or a compression format that is uh, as compressing as the Lampel-Ziff family and byte pair encoding and a couple of other compression formats, at least up to log factors. Um, now I basically don't know much about these things. You will know much more about this than me. Uh, for me, the important part is that it's a generic framework of compressed strings and it's mathematically elegant in the sense that uh, it avoids all the technical details that you want from like a, an actual compression format like Lampersif. Okay, now because it's, it like generically describes what uh, what zipped strings mean uh, in, in, a, in an abstract way. Uh, it makes sense to to study algorithms on grammar compressed strings, right? So, for example, let's say we want to solve the longest common subsequence problem, but our strings are now well, strings of length big n compressed to size little n. So, in other words, we're give, given two zipped strings, and we want to know uh, how similar are they. This certainly makes sense, right? Um, the, um, I mean, DNA sequences, for example, are so long that you want to zip them if you want to uh, transfer them somewhere. So it makes sense that uh, uh, you also want to avoid unzipping them uh, to check how similar they are. Um, uh, so it makes sense to study algorithms that directly work on zipped strings, or grammar compressed strings. Now, certainly what you can always do to solve such a problem is to uh, uncompress, first uncompress the string and then run the classic algorithm. This gives running time big n squared, right? Uncompressed length squared. The big question in this context is whether you can get compressed size squared, or like the, the classic running time, but you only apply it to the compressed size. I mean, you can certainly not expect anything faster than this, Right? If you would get faster than little n squared, uh, then you would also break the, uh, the n squared algorithm in the classic setting. So the, the truth of the complexity of LCS on grammar compressed strings, the truth has to be somewhere between big n squared and little n squared. Um, and, um, and actually Tiskin came up with the first algorithm that, um, that solves this problem in time, big n times little n up to log factors, and there are log factor improvements by lots of other people. Um, so, so it seems that the, or I mean, the, the upper bound is somewhere in between these two, and you don't have to fully uncompress the string, but, uh, but at least, um, I mean, in a sense, you have to uncompress one of the strings in a very vague sense. Uh, so the, 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 the algorithmic running time is somewhere between full uncompression and not, not uncompressing anything. Now, what about lower bounds? It's known that the longest common subsequence on grammar compressed strings is NP-hard, even PP-hard, whatever that means. Certainly it's NP-hard, um, which means that, well, unless P equal NP, you cannot expect the polynomial time problem, which in this context here means that you cannot expect time polynomial in little n and log of big n. Okay, that's some lower bound, uh, but it's very far from saying whether it's big n times little n or some other n time, right? Actually, if you, if you look at the proof, or I mean, if, you, if you're willing to assume Seth or even just the exponential time hypothesis, then you actually get uh, from this NP hardness some running time of the form n to the omega of one. So whenever you prove NP hardness in this context, you can interpret it as saying you must have a polynomial dependence on the uncompressed length. But even then, it's I mean it's not saying that you need big n times little n. Okay. Uh, what our contribution was to this field is that um, well we we show this some um, show a matching lower bound based on that. So uh, you cannot solve this problem in big n times little n to the one minus epsilon. If you would do so, you would violate this. We would falsify the strong exponential time hypothesis. Okay, uh, time is over. Uh, so, um, 
uh, we do this for a couple of more problems. Uh, there are also a couple of interesting open problems, like what is the optimal depend uh, rank time for Hamming distance, but let me just skip directly to the end. Um, I've shown you lower bounds based on the strong exponential time hypothesis, tight lower bounds, um, like lower bounds that match the best, op best, op the, the best known algorithms. And this works for many different problems. I mean, I showed you longest common subsequence and regular expression pattern matching, a couple of more. It also works in many different settings, like I discussed this classing setting and grammar compressed, and, and there are more settings where you can do these kinds of things. Uh, it also doesn't not only work with respect to the input size, you can also look at the compressed size and uncompressed size, and you can also look at many different parameters for LCS. And um, yeah, for the end user, it uh, like uh, um, the most important uh, thing I guess uh, I think is that it gives the ind an indication on which problems you should work on or should not work on. Um, so so also you should use it. Um, and yes, I'm aware that here I'm more or less preaching to the choir. I mean. Uh, my selection of what I presented today was very much biased towards the thing that I, the stuff that I, I worked on personally. Uh, I know that uh, lots of people that regularly publish at CPM also prove these kinds of lower bounds. So yes, I'm aware that I'm preaching to the choir here, but in case that you haven't used Seth to prove a conditional lower bound, you should use it. And uh, let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carl.